Hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to talk about a couple of tools that I've been working on and how they help you bundle uh, your front-end web applications with HTTP2. So a couple of things I'm going to cover is just a, a rough intro on uh, how server push actually works, not the basics of HTTP2. I'm assuming you're familiar with that, or there's other talks to explain that better. Uh, and then there's two demos that I want to show, the two projects that I mentioned. One is going to help you um, reduce latency and save bandwidth, so therefore accelerate your websites. And the other one is going to help you uh, transpile, particularly for projects that are being served with HTTP2 server push. Um, HTTP2 server push is basically adding bundling, like you would do with a Webpack or Browserify, all these things, into the protocol layer. It introduces a new semantics into the protocol. Most of the other stuff in HTTP2 is really just the same as HTTP 1.1, but better, so you get marginal improvements in performance. But with HTTP 2 server push, you can achieve much greater uh, advantages. So lots of different little, little uh, you know, pros and cons, uh, like pluses for a server push over the legacy file concatenation, I guess you'd call it. So um, it's native in the browser, so the browser can optimize it. It works for any file, not just JavaScript or CSS or, or images. It just works blindly across it all. Uh, you can uh, cache individual files and update just those ones rather than an entire bundle. Uh, and it works on, a on the very first request, so you don't have to like, load the HTML and then serve your concatenated file. You can serve everything from the, like, straight from uh, the first uh, response. All right, and you know, file concatenation, we're all familiar with some of the problems that it has. So I want to show you basically how a server push request flow goes real quick. So you get a request coming in from a browser to your web server, let's say for slash, for the home page. What's going to happen is your server is going to analyze that and say, OK, you, you know, if you're looking for the home page, you're probably going to need a favicon as well. So I'm going to serve you a fake request, because that's what a promise is. It's a fake request, not just a response, but a request first. And it's going to say, I'm going to put it on another, another HTTP2 stream. HTTP2 has lots of different streams. They all go over the same socket. Um, but just keep that concept in mind. But it can push lots and lots of different promises, right? lots of different requests that it's anticipating the client to make. Finally, it's going to serve the actual response to the original request. It's going to serve the headers and the body. And then once, that's, once the browser has that, it's going to start pushing all those promises. So now it's serving the responses to these requests that it pretended occurred. So those all go over the, over the wire. And we've got a lot of these streams um, going on independently. So you can prioritize things. You can schedule things. Um, it's pretty cool. So let's see what we can do. We've got a tool called HTTP2 Server. And let's do a little demo, see what happens if we try this in, in um, comparison to previous practices. I've taken uh, one of Simon Swain's epic projects from uh, last year's conference. And I want to see how, how fast it works with uh, HTTP2 versus HTTP1 concatenation. Here on the left-hand side, I've got a browser simulating a connection from Singapore to uh, San Francisco. That's roughly you know, 300 milliseconds of artificial latency. But I've got a gigabit connection, because Singapore is pretty good like that. But what, what's going to happen with this latency? If we run a server that serves the HTTP1 version of the project, which has a lot of JavaScript files and some CSS, and then we load that page, that extra latency is going to force a lot of round trips. So we're seeing this graph here, this traditional waterfall. The green parts are basically the latency on the network. There's very little time actually transferring, because I've got a gigabit, right? But the latency is going to kill my app. Look at that. So it's taking like four seconds. All right, so let's see what happens with HTTP2. If I run an HTTP2 server, all I have to do is this. And by the way, the HTTP2 server it's blind to any kind of file type, so I don't have to configure a you know, complicated gulp script or a webpack config. It just serves everything in, and pushes it. Very easy. So let me turn off this CPU monster, all right, and go over to the HP2 site, run that, and see what happens. It's got, it's got one request, and it's pushing tons of files. All those requests are now getting pushed. And how long did that take? About the same. Oh, that's not good, right? So why is that? So the, a lot of that it goes. If you look at this stuff here, it's excruciatingly slow, right? You get a request, and then, you know, favicon takes 105 milliseconds? What's that? So this server is optimizing your files with, you know, complicated compression that takes about 100 times longer than gzip. So it's not meant to be streaming. So when you start the server, it's going to have a cold cache. When you're running this again and again, it's going to start warming up the cache, you know, keeping all these assets in memory in a compressed state and eliminate all of that. So let's say we clear the log. The server is still running. 
and we can go back. Caching is disabled, you can see. And run it again, bam. So how fast was that, right? So everything is now like, you know, zero, zero or one millisecond. And on the network, it took a second. So we're three times faster, just eliminating all of the latency. And that's what server push will do. You get one shot of latency. That's the minimal amount of latency that you're going to have to accept because that's just your network. But everything else can be eliminated with HTTP server push, whereas concatenation cannot do this. So, all right, that's a pretty good result. Let's talk about how that actually works. Go back. So our page load time is really a function of latency and bandwidth. There's a, it's called a bandwidth delay product, if you want to look this up. You know, basically, the product of your data link capacity, that's like your aggregate bandwidth, like a gigabit per second. And your round trip time, measured in seconds, would be you know, 0.3 seconds from here to you know, the west coast of US. Um, this is called the long, fast networks. I'm not sure it's called Eleven or Elephant. I like elephants, so I'm going to call it elephants. And this is a common case for most people around the world nowadays, that you have a data center that's around the world, and you yourself have a very high-powered mobile device, and you're probably on a like, pretty speedy 4G connection or, or beyond going forward. And we need to optimize the latency. So how does HTTP do that? We saw it basically cuts out your graph. You know, left-hand side loads in one second. If you have a lot of latency, it could take like an order of magnitude more than that, just because requests in induce and compound this latency. So that's pretty sweet. What else can we do to eliminate? Well, the other, the other half of the product would be the bandwidth. If you, can, if you can get free bandwidth from compression and this magical thing called cache digests, that will help a lot. So let's, let's look at that. So I mentioned that we're doing this very fancy compression. It introduces a massive load of uh, you know, computational demand on the server. But you know, with caching, we can, we can avoid you know, any kind of performance impact. And the two codecs that, that I'm using here, Zopfly or Zopfly, I don't know how you pronounce it. Um, basically, that's compatible with gzip. So any browser that supports gzip, it's going to support this slightly more compressed version of, the, of your output. But if you're using, let's say, Firefox or uh, Chrome, you've, you can support Broadly. And that's going to save significant amounts of bandwidth. Now, it's only working on HTTPS. If you, hadn't, if you noticed that in the, the demo that I showed, the HTTP 1 version was just you know, a plain static web server uh, running on HTTP. But the HTTP 2 one had to run on HTTPS. And one of the troubles that I think a lot of developers are familiar with is setting up like, certificates for local host development, getting them signed, adding the exceptions to your browser. It's a pain. So I've kind of taken care of that. It's, when you run HTTP server the first time, it'll register, generate a certificate, hook it up to your keychain, and your browser will just have a green, secure website thing. It's fantastic. So even if you just use it for that, you're going to have a good time. Um, next, we've got cache digest to save us, save us some bandwidth. And this is huge. And this is new to me until like a month ago. I, I'm not a computer science type of person. Um, so I didn't know anything about Bloom filters. And I was like, oh, Lord of the Rings. Okay. Uh, Golem coded Bloom filters, it's a thing, right? Um, but basically, right, what we're doing is we're telling the server which files we've already got cached. And we're, we're basically hashing, fingerprinting every file, or just the URL, taking a couple of bits from that, sticking them all together into a little header, and telling the server here, this, these are the files we have. Anything, you already, anything that matches that, that you're trying to push me, just don't push it. So essentially, we're skipping all of the unnecessary files that haven't changed since the last time I visited a page. Huge savings, because most of the times, not your entire app is changing. Tiny parts of your code base incrementally evolve, but most of the libraries and frameworks, they're not changing all the time. So that's basically how it works. That's what it's meant to do. Um, there's a spec, pretty recent from this year, uh, that's doing this all over. HTTP frames. Um, I'm using, uh, because, it, because the browser needs to support that natively, I'm using a service worker for Chrome and Firefox and a cookie fallback, so it works on every single browser right now, which is pretty cool. So we save a lot of bandwidth, and we save a lot of latency with that, too, because all these round trips are now eliminated. So second tool that I've got for you is called Unbundle. And I'll show you a little demo of that as well. So this is going to help you with the front-end development side of things. Everyone's familiar with the JavaScript fatigue, so let's, let's set up a little imaginary, uh, tiny little hello world project. So we're, we're, you know, we want to use um, proper tools. So we've got React framework from NPM, which is awesome. Um, NPM, I mean, I'm not really a React, yeah, whatever, each their own. And we've got a minimalist uh, application, JavaScript, HTML, and there we go. So what do we normally do? We set up a Webpack build or a Gulp thing or you know, who knows what, right? It's a lot of work. Let's cut all that short and say unbundle. And it's going to run. But you know, this, this computer has about the power of most people's phones, if you bought them this year. 
Um, but yet, yeah, it's going to be pretty quick, right? And the reason is that it's doing all this stuff in parallel. So I've got two cores in here, well, two physical cores. So it's going to run you know, parallel builds on this. And it's tracing all of the files that we have, which is all mostly React, obviously. It's just one, my, one of my own files and probably like 170 files from React. It processed them all, and then we run HTTP2 server, and we're going to host that website. Eh, maybe not. OK, I've got to kill the other one. Well, give me a second. Here we go. OK. Port issues. Here we go. So we're running our server now and serving the files that we just created. That's the static files. And because these, these commands have nothing inherently to do with each other, but they just assume you know, sensible defaults, so they kind of work well together. You could use either one without the other. So let's clear our browser, no tricks up our sleeves, and see what happens if we load our app. OK. Like I said, the first time, the caching needs to load. OK, well, it worked. So we've got our ES6 app. We've got no, node modules. It's all working. It's pretty sweet. And if we look at the log, we can see there's a lot going on here. What is that, right? But really, we're using push just like before with the static uh, Cold War demo. Here we've got one request coming in at the top, this get for the home page. And then we're just going to push app.js and a lot of emoji. That's kind of interesting. We'll talk about that. But a lot of these node modules is just going to be pushed individually. Rather than like a Webpack bundle everything in one, in one blob, it's all happening individually. And at the end here, there's a service worker. And that's got to, something to do with the cache digests. So that's kind of sweet. Let's, let's, ju let's jump back into the, uh, the, the, you know, the slides. So this tool is all based on you know, really incredible technology. Um, Browser 5 for dependency tracing, Babel for doing a lot of the processing, you know, mapping the file paths, and then finally using system.js behind the scenes to uh, asynchronously load things in the browser. You're not actually interacting with these tools anymore. We're abstracting over them and building the next generation of tools for front-end development. It's got a lot of stuff built in, batteries included. It's minified. You've got your source maps for your development, and you've got all this latest syntax available for you to use. Normally, this takes a lot of time. I know I took a lot of time to learn all these things and set it all up. Now it's very easy. Like I said, it's, very, it's going to be very fast, especially if you have like quad core or going forward, or you're running this on a build server with like, maybe, maybe you have like 32 cores on your build server. Your builds are going to be lightning fast. It's got a watch mode as well for incremental builds, it takes milliseconds. Right? Happening in parallel, it's pretty sweet. All right. Um, like I said, we're using service, it's, it's using service workers. That means it's got uh, some little JavaScript running in the browser, right? It's like having a CDN on the client's machine. It's insane. Um, it's using a cache API, which is kind of a misnomer. Like, the more I started using it, the more I figured out that this isn't really for caching. It's kind of just a key value storage for requests and responses. It doesn't have any kind of complicated. You actually have to, have, have, have to implement all of the HTTP caching logic from scratch, which isn't something everyone should be doing, I feel. So you can rely on something like that that's, pre that's already been prepared um, to take care of that without errors. Now, cache control immutable is another recent spec that came out this year. And it's going to tell the browser to never invalidate an asset. That's kind of cool, right? If you have an asset that you guarantee to never change, like you're file revving it, you should, your browser should, isn't even going to check if it's you know, out of expired until that max age has, has uh, passed. But if you set like a, a file revved, uh, asset to expire in 10 years, your browser is never going to even do a round trip at all. And you can guarantee that. You can rely on that, and your service worker is going to read it from cache, put it in a digest, and your server is never going to push that file ever again. So you save huge bandwidth. Um, of course, you have to be careful with that, so I'm only applying this to ref files. Now, those emoji in the uh, file names, what's up with that? Well, this is my solution to cache invalidation, which is the hardest problem in computer science. And I think emoji are the solution to most hard problems. I'm using uh, XXHash64, which is a really, really fast fingerprinting uh, algorithm. And then encoding that in emoji, right? Because it's just bits, and why not? You know, hex is so lame. So you stick an emoji in there. As soon as you change your file, it's going to come up with a new emoji. And to the browser, it's all transparent. This works. You know, I'm surprised there wasn't actually any serious issues with this on any tools. Um, I showed this to some people, and they liked it as well. <laughs> so. That's my two projects, and uh, I hope you enjoyed them. I enjoyed working on them, and I think this is the future. Thank you.